Hello, thanks for joining us for this uh, very first meetup for the Berlin Tech Talk. Do it yourself, software defined data center. So, this is the first one. Um, we plan to have multiple of them, and I'd like to start with a very high level talk about what might be in here in the next uh, meetups as well. So, it's a very high level talk and just a very broad thing. Um, Martin will join us later for an in depth. No, uh, it's not being <laughs> <laughs> So, um, you will see some code, but not from me. So, let's start. Uh, my name is Matthias Rahnke. I'm uh, working in the Cobalt Engineering team here at Cobalt. Um, topic today is software is eating the data center. And let's see how far this goes. <laughs> this is a concept of uh, Google data center which they planned out to roll out in 1999. So um, this was their first idea how to build very commodity hardware, or big cluster, and they plan to have multiple of them. And this is just a zoom of this one. Um, a network interface card, a hard disk drive, CPU, and so on. You know how these things look like, but really just the bare minimum of what's required, and as efficient as possible. This is how they look today. Um, thousands of thousands of machines. Um, question is, now that we have thousands of these machines, what do we do with them? And this is actually what the talk is about. Software defined data center, let me try to define this word. Um, maybe you have heard infrastructure as a service or cloud computing. Um, in the end, it's um, trying to build virtualized infrastructure which is completely decoupled from all the hardware that you just saw and make it somehow manageable. So what helps to achieve this is, uh, or how they did this, especially if you have a look at Google, is um, they started with software defining everything, um, making in software. So we have compute, networking, storage, and lots of, lots of glue code and software to manage, run and drive all these systems. From a user's perspective, you might know this today, Visa card and HTTP requests, and that's your cloud. Everything is very shiny, very fancy. It's super easy to access very complex infrastructures. You get for cheap money, big instances of hardware, whatever you would want to have. You have reproducible infrastructure, so basically you can code what you want to have, just put in some HTTP requests and then we get your virtual infrastructure, your completely virtualized data center within seconds in the end. You're super agile with this, everything is up and running in seconds, not uh, trying to get um, an, uh, sorry, English work of an, an Antrag to buy some new hardware and put it somewhere in your data center. It's super elastic, so you can start very small, even on a single machine and then just grow whenever you need. Um, and you just pay for what you use. Um, this is not bad. So from an operator perspective, um, it's a super centralized infrastructure management. So all these machines, you can just, with some people, you can um, build such a system and run and operate it. If Google or Microsoft or Amazon buys a cluster, it will just hundreds of servers or hundreds of racks, call it a cluster, push a button, then things are rolled out, and it's super automated. So there's close to no human intervention necessary to pull up complete clusters, except for putting them into the data center. In the end, this allows very scalable operations. And it's very efficient, because uh, um, they let, with this virtualization, they let many, many clients on the shared hardware and they get a high resource utilization. So there are no idling machines, there are no GPUs which are idling on the server. And this enables uh, the economies of scale. So if you are able to just build one of these clusters, uh, you know how to operate it, it's very easy to just put in another hundreds of them. In the end, by making everything virtual and, and just software defined, you are completely decoupling um, your infrastructure from hardware, um, uh, from buying the hardware. So you can actually plan for the next month and do not need to plan for the next years to just, oh, this graphic card, I will need it for that. Um, um, project, something like that. So this is not uh, valid anymore. Cloud computing in general, 
Um, is it just someone else's computer? Uh, would you like to go for private, for public, for hybrid cloud? Um, so th there are many, many talks about this and many issues. Uh, can we go, uh, as a company, go private or public or something in between? And we need to consider here things like compliance or security. Uh, there are many risks involved. Um, would you like to control the complete stack? Who owns those things? So if I have my complete data center in Amazon Cloud, for example, and they just want to shut my company down for some reason, um, basically I'm lost and need to move things. And in the end, it's the um, price uh, tag uh, involved. So um, we have some customers who store many, many petabytes of data. And if you try to uh, calculate the costs for just having them online somewhere in the cloud data center, this is basically just too expensive. Uh, just for storing them, but also the data transfer. So every bit that goes in and out of the data centers costs a lot of money. So there's a, at some point in time, there's a tipping point where it's actually not just um, more powerful, more performant, but also very much cheaper to host or build for yourself. Um, so for example, Dropbox just recently moved to a private data center because it's way more cheaper than having it all in Amazon. What are the enablers of these software-defined infrastructures? Um, in the end, we just saw this Google example, so the commoditization of hardware. Back then, many, many years ago, we had very special um, storage systems, very special compute systems, and so on and so forth. Today, to basically just take the building blocks that you have, combine them, whatever you need, buy hundreds of them, stack it up, uh, install some software, and you're good to go. One of the important drivers here is we have very fast networking. Um, and this enables a lot, but I will talk about that uh, later a bit more. And then um, advances in infrastructure research and software. So um, also again, uh, a guy named Leslie Lamport, for example, which also is part of Google in the end, um, has put a lot of uh, um, new research into the how to actually drive distributed computing, uh, make things super reliable and fast, and how to actually use these big data centers. In a meaningful way. And then, of course, there are lots of economic drivers. So, software is eating the world. Um, we have lots of uh, new businesses needing lots of infrastructure. And um, there is actually a huge requirement of these virtual uh, data centers. A little bit of where we come from, what we require to get there. Um, when you started, talking with computers like 10 years ago, you actually knew their name. So it was more like a pet that had a name. Um, you build and manage it by hand, log in, install some software, so basically hand-fed. Um, they had to be always available, and uh, actually then you would put in more disk drives, more RAM, more CPU to just have uh, your little pet very nice and shiny. Today, um, a computer basically just has a, a name to, to find it in your data center. This is encoded into the name, so nothing fancy anymore. Um, they are completely automated, created, fully automated. But they are designed for failure, so basically you could just rip out a complete rack and everything will just work on smoothly. They are API driven, API driven so everything has an API today. And they are built for scale out, so just add more and more and more and you will just scale out linearly with your performance. Let's talk a, bit, a little bit about software-defined compute. So how do we compute the bits? Um, so today we have bare metal provisioning. So basically you just start your machine and we'll get how the operating system should look like in the software that it runs somewhere from the network. We have hypervisors to run virtual computers in the end. We started with sort of emulating complete computers, now we have lots of hardware support so that they can run at near bare metal speed. We have full operating systems on these hypervisors, but there's also something called unikernels, which is quite interesting. So they rip out everything from the um, uh, operating system and just have basically a single process running directly on the hardware. And then, of course, containerization, Docker, uh, and so on and so forth. Take the Linux, uh, for example. Uh, put in some namespaces and C groups and you have these containers. And then there are now something called user space containers because you don't want to run your Docker as root. So um, again, Google uh, 
put in this G advisor, which is basically the user space thingy. Um, if anybody's interested, I'd love to talk about this project later over here. Hardware support, how does it look like? So I start with this emulating things completely in a computer. Now um, CPUs have these VXT and AMD V via something, uh, many very fancy names. But in the end, it's always slicing physical cores or providing parts of hardware to the virtual machines. The CPUs also have uh, managed and private, uh, manage, they, no, sorry, they manage privileged and guest modes for uh, your applications. Then um, you can share PCI devices. So for example, take a network interface card, put it in your physical machine and then provide access to multiple virtual machines, but with direct connection to the, the machine. So actually you share parts of the uh, PCI interfaces to your virtual machines, which is quite interesting because um, you have direct access to the hardware. This holds also true for GPUs or TPUs or whatever accelerators that you have. Um, in the end, it's always either you get some, some shares of the systems completely isolated to the processes or um, time slices. How do we transfer the bits? Um, Software-defined networking. Um, so in the end, it's still you have network interface cards, cabling them together, and then bits can transfer. But in the end, what we have now is software-defined networking is a very high-performance data plane and a um, very flexible control plane to actually configure everything via software again. And what we have are overlay networks, which are put on top of these physical networks. So you can have your private virtual network on a very fast interconnect. And then in software, you can build uh, switches, routers, firewalls, load balancers, whatever we had years ago in hardware dedicated, very expensive machines are now just some lines of code. Also, physical networks are getting fast. So 40 gig is more or less common rock today. Um, 100 gigs are rolled out uh, everywhere and they are even faster. And in the end we have something like 10 microseconds round trip times between machines and this enables some interesting things. For example, uh, just as for software-defined storage, it's interesting, or for storage at all, um, before you had your physical devices in the machines from where you access them, but with just, say, 10 microseconds of latency between the devices, and you have an average access latency for SSDs or of 100 microseconds, it's just these 10 microseconds extra just we don't really care about them. So we completely decouple the, the accessor of the data from the actual physical location. And this enables, um, is a big enabler for software-defined storage. So our definition of software-defined storage is uh, something like put your, um, or get your commodity hardware, put in some disk drives, whatever you have, uh, run them with maybe hyper-converged with your compute virtual machines, whatever you have, alongside with the disks. Um, this is something that you can build out of it. But the interesting part here with the virtualization of storage is you completely decouple your logical bits from the physical locations of the files. And what this also enables is that you can fully have full flexibility of how to configure these systems, how to run the systems. And for every file, you can decide in software where and how to store and assemble the, the actual data. And again, you can run these multi-tenancy approaches, so shared, isolated uh, users, clients, virtual machines, whatever you have, and they can run on the very same set of disk drives, SSDs, and VMDs. Here again, um, Many years ago, we had these big boxes, we had high availability, master, master, something. So there, they got the reliability and performance out of those systems. And today, it's just software, it's algorithms which solve all these problems. The blueprint, and this is as technical as I get in this talk, um, how to build such a software-defined data center. And these are just some, some buzzwords and just one idea how we could do this. So basically, you start with buying some hardware, 
uh, provision your cluster with the tool like Foreman or Matchbox, which we will see later how this works. Set up your networking, set up an orchestrator for um, VMs or um, containers, um, so later we will see how this works with Kubernetes. Then you need to have some sort of identity management, put in some software storage, and uh, some more tools for monitoring, alerting, billing, whatever services you would like to provide. And then you're good to go as an operator. Then the client can use, for example, Terraform or Ansible to spin up its virtual infrastructure, and then you're good to go deploy applications and profit. Very simple. Works in 30 minutes. I hope so. <laughs> um, software defined X, so what's next? So we have compute, we have storage, we have networking. This is more something that I, that I read about in the last days or so things, and I'm interested <coughs> if we might see something like that in the future. So since we know it's what software defined power, um, so when is power available? When do we have too much? When do we have too little? And uh, since, especially in a data center, we exactly know which machine consumes how much power, where things um, need to be cooled, how hot zones are. Um, we can actually try to schedule algorithms or parts where actually we have power or when things are available and shift things in the data center. Um, one of these examples is the Chinese Bitcoin miners who are actually starting their ASICs when there is too much water in the, um, the, the water um, power plants. So, Basically, very simple part of this. Uh, an example. Okay, so uh, conclusion: the data chain, data center is changing, and uh, fast networks are actually the key to achieve all these nice things. Today, everything has an API and uh, some tools to actually use it and make meaningful things with it. Everything is uh, so. Everything is reached through decoupling and virtualization virtualization, so the actual logical representation of anything, um, a file, a computer, a network, whatever, does nothing, has nothing to do with the actual physical representation of it. And this is really the, the difference from the classical data center to the fully virtually software-defined thing. In conclusion, I would say software already ate the data center, so there is not much more to actually eat. Um, Maybe you have an opinion on that, and I'd like to hear that. But there is actually, I don't know what else could be virtualized here. So, since we have all these credit card HTTP requests, so. <laughs> that's it. Um, I have only four slides of advertisements. <laughs> so if you know all the deals, free beer, free snacks, a uh, little bit of um, why you are here and what we are actually. So, I'll try to be fast. Uh, we are part of this software defined story and we use commodity services and actually turn them into the software defined storage. It's a data center file system and basically for every workload that you have in your data center we have a good thing that fits into there. We have block storage, object storage and actually file access. We have this linear scalability so add a rack, install Cobite, scale linearly and we are designed for lights out operations, so fully automated, everything that you would expect to run on thousands of machines. A little bit of this blueprint, take the machines, put in whatever you have, install the Linux, download and install Cobite, and you're good to go. And we will actually see how this is working with some sort of hyper-conversion thing with Martin showing us. Everything that you find in today's data center, uh, we have sort of an integration. Um, take OpenStack as one of these orchestrators, so we are a perfect fit for that. Um, with all the container infrastructures, you can actually use them, we have a good solution for that. If you run big data, um, we have, for example, a Hadoop connector, which is even faster than the original HDFS system that they built. They are metal, so if you have a virtual Windows, Linux, whatever you have, uh, you can access a parallel file system. And then, um, actually, right now we have, you can run a Cobite software inside of other, other data centers and use their virtual machines, uh, their local NVMEs, whatever they have. 
Um, so basically, you bring your own shared file system. We have some customers actually doing this with new features with like async replication. You are also able to do this hybrid cloud thing: uh, host data here, mirror some things into the data center, let them run there, get things back. One thing, this is my last slide, and this is some part of our product which is really awesome, I think, um, is that independent of which client you're using, uh, you actually have access to the same file. And this also means if you have um, your Mac OS put in a file, you can use that particular file to run HDFS jobs on it and directly have a look at uh, we are S3, so an object is a file, um, it's all the same with us and you can lock and uh, do your ACL, so the, the complete story around this one file is shared with all the interfaces that you will find and use in your data center. Thank you for surviving these four slides, um, <laughs> thank you for listening and not falling asleep. Um, I hope you have taken at least a little bit out of the store. Uh, very high level today. Martin will show us some code, so if you're here for some code, we'll see you very soon. If you have any questions, maybe now or later, over here, um, I'm here all the time. Thank you.